Hi, I'm Mike Watson, convener of People and Ideas, artist and fashion educator. You know, in preparing to meet with you, I discovered that you were born in Guam. Yeah. And you were raised in Spain. Right. So, in that and <laughs> with what you do, how do you think that has, um, I don't know, influenced your artistic endeavors? Oh, okay. Yeah, it's a little bit non-traditional. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we uh, military family. Oh. So yeah, uh, being born in Guam and then living in Madrid, um, growing up, um, absolutely shaped like what I do in the arts field, uh, how I approach my designs, um, the type of people I surround myself with. So it's very multicultural. It's, it's kind of big picture global perspective. What was cool is that I got that early on. You know, so I, once you're in Spain, you get to travel around. So you have that North African feel and you have from France and then, you know, so and as a child growing up, I got to go to the Prado Museum anytime I wanted to and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Opportunities that you wouldn't get elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So you see it in my house, in my art, in, in my music that I like in, and in my designs that I do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, and then what's more interesting is you went from that environment to Nebraska. And like, at what age did you go to Nebraska? Right, that was a that culture shock. <laughs> yeah, that was a little different. So yeah, you come from this really interesting European perspective, mm -hmm. and then you're in the middle of America. So at first it was a little bit hard. Um, it was like um, high school and then my college oh, years. Wow, okay. So, you were so older. Yeah, yeah, so it was interesting. Um, but you know what's cool about it is then again it reshaped me. Mm -hmm. And and you know, so you had all these interesting global perspectives from Europe, but then I got this really interesting kind of middle of America work ethic, mm -hmm. kind of uh, attention to detail, you know, mm -hmm. big open spaces, kind of collaboration in terms of when you work. Mm -hmm. So that was an interesting thing that I layered on and those kind of elements I saw crept in like when I was the regional director for Saks and mm -hmm. stuff like that, that mm -hmm. I pulled from some of those same things. What was your major in college? Um, my undergraduate degree was in fashion and textile design. Mm -hmm. So that was really interesting because I got to not only learn basic fashion construction and fashion design, I, I had my own clothing line for a while, right out of school. Mm -hmm. But then I also got to learn the whole textile design. Mm -hmm. So weaving, printing, silk screening. And, and in, when I was in school, I used to do these very, very large silk screen projects that um, hospitals used to purchase and hang in their entryways and stuff mm -hmm. as kind of like three dimensional pieces. So. Okay. It's, it's really interesting because then I got a real sense of scale mm -hmm. that you don't get with just working with clothes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So did you, after college, did you stay in Nebraska or did you, you know, after, you know, being, especially in fashion and design right. and did you like, did you just like break out and, <laughs> right. you know, get to a major city? And, are you, are you and saying Nebraska is not a fashion mecca? Um, it isn't. You know, for some. Right. Stuff like plaid shirts. <laughs> exactly. And, and wranglers. And work, work outfits. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So no, there was this real conscious effort that that obviously to make my way to where I wanted to be, I was going to have to get out of there. Mm -hmm. And and not that there was an opportunity, because I did work there initially right after school for a little bit, and that's actually how I got hired on the Saks, mm -hmm. is because of some retail background and stuff. So there was a benefit, you know what I mean, okay. to getting that. But yeah, then I moved very quickly um, to different places. I was in, you know, by Chicago, and then I was up in Green Bay, Wisconsin, because I did some merger acquisition and did some design up there. Okay. And then uh, Philadelphia, Atlanta, mm -hmm. um, worked in LA quite a bit. Okay, wow. um, so yeah, once I got out, that's what I love about the fashion industry, mm -hmm. is that 
you can go anywhere and work. Mm -hmm. And there's this really interesting sense of collaboration. So mm -hmm. I'm an artist, I have a studio, I show in galleries, I have a, a, a large clientele list, so there's that whole world, fine art. Mm -hmm. And then I teach fashion marketing and design and still do custom design for certain clients. Mm -hmm. And I just finished doing an interior design store. I just did a store I just designed. And then I also do a lot of public speaking. So I speak at the Beckler Museum and I speak at TEDx. And then, you know, I do all these different things and that's a good question. But for me, it all works because if you remember, my whole mission now is to bring together different people and ideas. And so what's nice is that all those different fields come together kind of like in one place. And so what I think links everything together mm -hmm. is the decisions I make on what projects to do. Okay. So although it's different fields, mm -hmm. it's kind of always the same vision. Okay. Does that make sense? Sounds is that good. helpful? It yeah. Sense. It makes sense. So it's the same message that you're doing. Yeah. With all the different different vehicles. Exactly. Different audiences, but you have the same message. Right. Which is being a connector of so as yeah to be a connector of ideas and and so that other people can also create new perspectives and new art and new design and get it out to a bigger audience mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah so how did you um, get started like spreading your brand here in the Charlotte area like so you you, you hear you know one person one. You're with your wife right brand <laughs> city exactly um, you know, and it's and at that time, you know, it's it's growing, you know, so it's not even where it is it, today. Absolutely. So how do you start growing your brand here? Yeah. What are some of the early projects you worked on here in Charlotte? Sure. So two things there. One was I made a conscious effort because I wanted to rebrand myself, including my art vision with my fashion background, mm -hmm. because the art part had kind of gone away as I was doing more of the corporate work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the very first thing I did is found an art studio to do my work in. And I consciously made a decision. There was this great warehouse space downtown on Graham Street, which is now a parking lot. But it was this amazing old building. So it was the right environment, the right place. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. The right size. And then my second part of that is then I consciously made a decision to like stock the most interesting and successful artist in Charlotte at that time that I thought shared the same values I did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And be, by surrounding myself with successful people, it was much easier to become successful and get my brand out there. Because right. that network allows you to get that word out versus me trying to struggle by myself. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Okay, so switching gears. Sure. Which, you know, there's a lot of gears in your career. Um, so you're an instructor at the Art Institute of Charlotte. Right. Um, how did that come about? Did you ever see yourself being an instructor? No. <laughs> kind of like I never saw myself living in Charlotte. Same right. kind of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, there's this real idea of creating your own future, and that's what really started to happen when I got here. So, um, again, kind of a chance, if you want to say, or maybe a planned accident. My neighbor was the librarian at the Art Institute of Charlotte right when it was starting to come to the city, and we were having a conversation completely unrelated, and she mm -hmm. found out I had a fashion background, and I was an artist. Mm -hmm. And then she's like, well, we need instructors. And I was like, I've never thought about being an instructor, but whatever. So I went out there and interviewed that day, got hired that day, and have never left in their 12 years. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. So what is so? how do you define your approach to instructing your students? Yeah. Um, being that you don't have a, you know, a background. Right, it's not, not a traditional right, academic. Right, yeah. so, you know, so I would think you might have some unorthodox, you know, teaching methods or, you know. Yeah. Um, I think what's unorthodox is that it's not academic. Okay. You know, which I, I look back at when I was going to college and I was like, what did I like? And the only time I really remember and appreciated it was real life. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I institute immediately in my classroom is everything we're going to do is real life. We're going to use real clients. We're going to do real projects in the community. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to make sure that I push you to elevate yourself and gain that confidence so you have a voice out there in the community. Right. And it's not just a lesson in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, one of the more interesting ones was at the McCall Center mm -hmm. for Visual Art. Okay. Um, they happened to hear about me because of the Silo Project. Mm -hmm. Branding. Right. Okay. And they contacted me because one of the requirements of their artists in residence is that they do an outreach, a community project or an element with their, with their project. So they asked me if I would be willing to come up with something. And so I contacted the artist and she was doing these amazing to scale life-size clay replica sculptures of couture gowns. Mm. All these tiny little pieces of clay combined together with fiber and it was amazing and, and I was like, yes, we will do this. Mm -hmm. And so I got to teach my class at the McCall Center okay. every week mm -hmm. with my students. There was like 10 of them. And we learned the techniques and, the, and how she created things and we studied the different designers that Madame Vianney and different ones we were going to use. 
And then she allowed us to cons help construct the gowns that she was creating. Plus we constructed accessories like handbags and everything all out of clay. Talking about fashion um, and you being a fashion mm -hmm. instructor, um, you know, Charlotte's fashion scene, scene seems to be growing. Yes. Um, there's a lot of events, you know, surrounding fashion. You have Fashion Week, you have Style Not Out. Right. There's fashion shows like every week someplace. Like, Absolutely. You know, one last night at yep. Bubble. Like everybody's doing fashion shows. What do you think Charlotte can do in terms of making a name for itself in the fashion world? Because it seems like it's really moving towards that direction and that's really what, you know, a lot of individuals are trying to do, you know, here in Charlotte. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, kind of the answer is in the question. Mm -hmm. And so you mentioned all these different things that were going on. And, and I think for Charlotte to start to establish itself in the Southeast, mm -hmm. along with Atlanta, Miami, um, in terms of having a fashion voice is to not have so many different little things kind of competing with each other, but start to come together as a fashion community and have a I don't know, a consistent, it doesn't have to be consistent in terms of the vision, but it does have to be consistent in terms of how it's produced and how it's communicated and how it's marketed out to the rest of the world. Because right. mm -hmm. there is a definite Southern fashion style okay. that is interesting mm -hmm. and, and exists here and that I think a lot of people would love to kind of grab onto that look okay. and understand it better. What, how do you, how do you define the southeastern or the charlotte look yeah what is that what is that you look? know what's nice about that look is it's become very eclectic when i first moved here it was still very khaki you know blue collar mm -hmm. um banking industry traditional southern kind of that emphasis and that's still here and i think that's important because that's the roots right. and you, and you got to come from somewhere mm -hmm. But because so many people have moved here, mm -hmm. it's it's this kind of city that attracts people from all over Northeast and, and, and elsewhere, California, California <laughs> that everybody's kind of brought their own vision. And so now you have this really interesting, what I see anyway, is a very Southern traditional structure, like silhouette shapes, okay. but now mixed in with a very eclectic, kind of almost bohemian, and and more avant-garde like approach with the patterns and the colors yes. that they're willing to use yes, I it was very I restricted like before but now it's a lot more color yeah okay but i think living here because it's sunny all the time and it's a great you know you can get away with color mm -hmm. kind of year round right okay yeah. I think I'll add some color into my wardrobe. You, yeah, like, absolutely. I, like it's hard for me to do that, but <laughs> putting it that way, you're right. I could get away with that. Sure. Like beautiful trees, the colors. Exactly. The you know the leaves change. Why not wear color? Absolutely. I love it. Um, so you're the host of TEDx Charlotte. Yeah. That's no. just another thing. We're switching. Right. Again. One more thing. Okay. One more thing. So host of TEDx Charlotte. How long have you been doing that? Mm -hmm. How did that come about? Um, you know, I know you do a lot of lecturing. Yes. Um, but with TEDx, that's like really special, you know, because yeah. it's, you know, an international stage, really. Right. You know, international property. Right. Um, so how did, how did that happen? Yeah, TEDx, uh, first of all, is amazing. I mean, you're right. It's, it's, it's lecture format in a sense that you've got speakers, but it's completely different in approach. Um, that came about three years ago. Mm -hmm. Candace Langston, who has lived in Charlotte pretty much all her life, um, other than for a few uh, times that she was away at college and stuff, got a licensing from TED, which is what you have to do, and said, we think Charlotte would be great. We would love to extend that brand here to this city. Mm -hmm. And she contacted me and said, would you like to be involved in this? And I said, absolutely, I would love to be the host. Mm -hmm. And she's like, okay. Mm -hmm. She had no idea if I even knew what I was doing. But again, you know, it's one of those things in Charlotte because mm -hmm. it's very, comfortable and people like talk and you could just have that discussion she was very willing to support that vision okay. and so yeah i get i get to get up on stage every year and i get to connect the speakers that are doing amazing things around the globe mm -hmm. uh two past cnn heroes do you know what i mean have come from charlotte okay. and you know i get to take these individuals and connect them with the local community and audience mm -hmm. and we get you know oftentimes we live stream it mm -hmm. so there's other colleges and universities that get to take in the talks and what's going on. And so again, it fits perfectly in my vision, what I love to do. That whole idea of connecting people and ideas. Okay. Um, so you also like, you also designed a set for a TEDx. I did one year. You did one, okay. Yeah. Okay. So 
what what was that? What did we do? What yeah. Happened? Did you say like, hey, let me do this? I did. I have a great idea. I did. Or, uh -huh. That's what happened. Okay. Um, is I was like, hey, I have this great idea for this set design, mm -hmm. um, and I said, why don't we make this really large, three-dimensional brain that kind of hovers over the stage, and make it interactive so that as people are tweeting or do using social media, those comments and stuff pop up on the brain, kind of like how your brain is active. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of fit in with Ted's vision, you know, the TEDx vision of, of being innovative and it fits in with the idea of creativity. Mm -hmm. And they were like, okay, do it. And so then I brought in Mike Wirth, who's an instructor at Queens University, who's amazing with like infographics and, and technology. And then Drew Kinney and, this, and another gentleman kind of constructed it. So I drew it out, had some meetings. We, we developed the concept and it came to life. It was, it was awesome. So Charlotte is known for being a Southern traditional banking town. And you know, while it's certainly that, I do see a lot of support for the arts here. Mm -hmm. um, but I imagine that there's challenges, you know, with the dueling corporate and sure. art world. Um, what is your take on that in, in, in terms of getting support for the arts here in Charlotte? I think like Charlotte, like a lot of cities, the minute the economy is not really strong, the arts tends to become a second thought. Mm -hmm. You know, and in, whether that's in the school or in the city itself, um, so certain places struggle, the Arts and Science Council sometimes struggles to raise funds or the symphony or you know, things like that. But what's really interesting about Charlotte, and I think it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, which is there is this part about Charlotte that you can just go talk to someone. Right. Mm -hmm. And so people step up and all of a sudden money comes from somewhere to support the symphony or to raise enough funds to do the next project or you know, to make sure all the museums got moved downtown, the Mint Museum and the Beckler Museum of Modern Art and, to and, and the Levine Museum of the New South and kind of create this corridor of art. Um, so yeah, it's a struggle. Big picture wise, it's not like on line item budgets, a lot of people from a corporate perspective say, here's our arts budget, we're gonna make sure they really get funded. But the fact that they're open to talking to you okay. allows you an in that if you can say, here's this project, here's how it's gonna benefit the community, here's what we think the vision of it fits with our city, mm -hmm. I've never really struggled to get like kind of that support as you were saying. And I think that's why you still see a vibrant art market, even though, yes, there is struggles. Right. Do you have any advice you can give emerging artists here in Charlotte on how they can get support for a project that they're working on? Yeah. Um, you know, where could they go? What kind of resources are out there for them? Okay, um, big question. Okay, so. <laughs> They need to know. They do need to know. But I, yeah, okay, so a couple things. One is that my advice to emerging artists or artists trying to make, it, make a name for themselves is one, don't be afraid to fail. Um, you've got to understand that failure is part of the game and failure makes you better and failure allows you to reshape who you are and get the communication right. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is, kind of going back to our earlier discussion, is then surround yourself with successful people. Mm -hmm and you will be successful. Right. And Charlotte allows that. Okay. Charlotte is open to that. Right. Um, I'm open to that. I mentor people, artists, different people all the time, and, and a lot of times for free, um, it, you know, depending on the, on the case. Um, so I think that's part of it is, don't be afraid of failure, surround yourself with successful people, and then get your statement straight. What do you want to say about who you are and the impact it'll make on the community and society? Because people don't, care about what you do, people care about why you do it. They don't care that you're an artist, so to speak, but they do care about your passion. They do care about your values. They do care about your vision. And so if you can connect with them there, they'll support you. 